So we're finally ready to move on to 1D CNN uh, models for this uh, Burson classifier project I'm working on. And before I start talking about the 1D CNN model I implemented, um, again, I am not going to implement from scratch today. It actually took me quite a few hours to implement and um, uh, it would just, the video would just be way too long. So I'm just gonna go over the, the model that I already implemented. But uh, before I uh, start to talk about the model, I just want to uh, kind of go over the audio feature dimension so that we have a better understanding of uh, what it means um, for the 1D CNN model to work. Okay, so let's first consider an audio sample of eight seconds in duration and sample at 16,000 sample rate. With this, uh, we can calculate the number of frames, which in our example would be 251. So that would be the first dimension of the, um, the, this audio sample. And then we can also extract the audio features, which is um, in our example, 20 MFCC, then at each time, sp uh, time step. So then our ex uh, resulting MFCC feature dimension would be n frame by n MFCC, which would be 251 by 20. Uh, notably though, uh, when we first use Librosa to extract the features, um, the dimension comes out to be n feature and n frame. And as part of the uh, class methods that I implemented in one of the earlier videos, I talk about how uh, I need to transpose the features so that uh, I need to, uh, so that the average pool and the convolution are applied along the time axis. Okay, so this is kind of an uh, illustration of what, what the this process looks like. So when we first, in our example of a second duration sample at 16,000 sample rate, when we first pass through the um, Librosa feature extraction function, we can um, pass in the audio and the sample rate and the number of MCCs as parameters. And the output is gonna be um, the an, a NumPy array of uh, shape um, number of MFCCs by number of frames. So uh, this is the output from the Librosa feature extraction function. And we have, we can consider them as uh, 20 rows and um, the uh, number of frames, which is the time dimension is on the X axis. Okay, so uh, if, if we were to think of this as an image, right? Um, we would have the time at the time on the x axis and the number of MCCs on the y axis. Uh, the similarly, we can consider this uh, in the form of a table where we have a number of MCCs um, uh, in the rows and then the number of frames in the columns. And as part of the uh, feature extraction, I transpose them so that we get um, the number of the rows to be the number of frames and the columns to be the number of MCC. So the original shape of 20 by 251 is now 251 by 20. And to get a better understanding of what average pull along the time axis means. So essentially let's consider, uh, for example, in for the first MFCC, right? Where I have 20 of them. For the first MFCC, we have an MFCC representation for each time frame, right? So in, in our example here, we have five boxes. Each of them represent the first MFCC representation for um, the first time frame, the second time frame, the third time frame, um, et cetera. And when we do the average pool, we basically take the average of the five numbers and represent it as a one number. And the same thing would be applied for the second one and the third MFCC and so on and so forth. So essentially um, our original dimension of 251 by 20 would be reduced by uh, just a uh, one dimensional figure of uh, 20 columns. And each of the MFCC in the average pool output uh, would be an, um, you know, an average representation of uh, all the time um, uh, time frames for that MFCC. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Uh, so for all the models that I've implemented so far, uh, like uh, all the ensemble, uh, support vector machine, logistic regression, and fee for neural network, I've uh, been using the average pooled audio features um, so that um, uh, it, it can, it's essentially a uh, kind of a dimensionality reduction technique where I reduce a 2D representation feature to 1D. And this is especially useful when we're dealing with um, um, things like uh, uh, models with a kind of a simpler architecture. 
because if we have um you know for example if we have one feature that's of shape 251 by 20 um that would create 251 times 20 features right um versus if we do the average pool then we would only well, end up with 20 features for for that audio and when we have kind of a simple architecture the architecture actually cannot really um, make use of the all the 251 by 20 features um so uh, by average pooling uh, you're basically um, reducing the dimensionality of the feature and um, provide the model with the less feature to work with. And it, the model I actually would be able to perform better um, by looking at uh, more a condensed representation of the features. And there's another one uh, that's max pooling, which is very similar to average pooling, but instead of taking the average of the five numbers, uh, when we do the max pooling, we just take the uh, highest number of among the five numbers. Okay, um, so in the case where we, so this is just an example of one audio feature, right? So in the case where we have, for example, a hundred audio features, then a uh, hundred audios, then in, in our example of 100 audios, then each of the 100 audio can be considered as uh, rows. And then we would have uh, the number of MSCCs or whatnot features in the columns, right? So um, in our example that we've already went over for all of the previous models that we implemented, um, we would have, you know, for example, 100 samples and um, 20 columns for, um, as input features for our model. But uh, if we're going to, for 1D CNN, we're actually not going to do the average pooling. We're going to feed in this uh, 2D representation of the feature directly into the CNN model. Then it becomes a 3D, um, 3D input, right? Because we have the 100 uh, number of samples. And then for each sample, we have a 2D representation of the uh, feature. Okay, so I'm going to go over the uh, 1D CNN real quick. And um, in case we're not familiar, so 1D CNN is um, basically we're applying filters onto the um, features. And uh, what this means is this is a kind of a GIF representation of what uh, the feature, uh, what the filters are doing. Basically, the yellow is a fil uh, filter, and here we have a filter size of three because we have a, we're covering three rows at a time, and a stride of one because we're moving one step at a time. And um, so this is a one D CNN where it only moves in one direction. When if we have a two D CNN, then um, say that we have a two D CNN of um, with filter size two by two. When we have a two by two, then the, we would just cover this uh, small portion of a two by two cell. And then we would move the filter to the right and down. So that means we're moving in two directional versus right, right now we have the 1D CNN, we're just uh, moving one directional and each of the filter uh, will cover the entire width of the feature. So in the case where we have 32 features, then the uh, filter would be, uh, in our example, a uh, size of a three by 32, right? Because we have three rows and 32 columns would be our filter size. Okay, so um, the 1D CNN architecture is actually a little bit complicated comparing to the previous models I've implemented. And um, um, some notable differences comparing to the previous models I've implemented other than the model architecture is that um, first thing is I, um, for the continents, previously I did the one hot representation of the continents. Remember uh, one hot means like when we have five continents, we will essentially create five rows, uh, not five rows, five columns, and each column represents one continent. And, um, you know, if the first example is is Europe and um, in the Europe column, the number will be one and in all the other four columns, the number will be zero. Essentially, it's like an on and off switch. Um, but for the 1D CNN model, you, instead of using one hot uh, encoding of the continent, I decided to use embedding. Again, um, embedding is essentially a kind of a representation of word or um, not necessarily word, it could be uh, tokens, sentences, whatnot. But here I'm just, um, to keep it simple, our continents are words. So I'm just gonna say that the uh, I created embeddings, which is kind of a, um, a representation of the different words. So uh, 
I created the embedding of output dimension two, and that can be considered as, for example, for each of the continent, uh, remember we have five, uh, for each of the continent, um, we will have a um, two embeddings to represent that continent. So uh, for example, if we have um, uh, Europe, then we would have essentially two columns um, of embeddings that represent the Europe. Versa, uh, and so on and so forth for each of the continents. Okay, and then uh, another thing that's different is I also um, decided to use um, sample weights. So what sample weights uh, does is uh, it uh, assigns the different samples with different weights when training. So um, for example, the samples with uh, poor, more poor quality audio recordings would um, be would be given less weights. So that the model is um, would uh, it would help the model learn a little bit better. I would hope that um, basically if the audio quality is really really poor, the model would uh, be able to say, okay, maybe maybe don't be so confident that this is this uh, label. You know, this audio is associated with this label. But when the um, uh, audio quality is really good, then uh, I give it a little bit more weight. So that um, it essentially uh, helped the model uh, capture the um, uh, the features better for the, from the audios that have better qualities. Okay, and um, I am also going to talk about some of the other things that I did um, to make the model a little bit better compared to the previous models I've implemented. And um, I am just going to talk through the architecture real quick before I start going over the details of the model. Okay, so the first thing is um, we pass in the continents as input and we use a stream lookup, uh, which looks up the continents and then um, pass it to the embedding layer, which creates an embedding representation of the continents. And again, our embedding output is dimension two. So each for each continent, our embed will uh, have uh, a dimension of two embeddings. And then because our for each sample, we only have one continent, our embedding um, dimension is uh, one by two versus our audio feature. Remember we talked about is um, the number of frames by uh, the number of uh, features. So our audio feature have a dimension of 251 by 32. So to make the embeddings and audio features have the same dimension so that I can stack them or concatenate them, um, I essentially tile the embeddings along the time axis so that each embedding is repeated 251 times. And to make uh, the embeddings the same uh, kind of dimension as the audio features. And you can see here, um, once I tile the embeddings to two, 251 times, uh, I get the uh, output of uh, embedding tiled is 251 by two and our input for the audio features 251 by 32. And then we can concatenate them to create a combined feature of 251 by 34. And this is then being passed into the 1D um, Kong filter and the max pooling layers. And um, again, we can think of the 1D Kong filter as um, from this GIF where we have, uh, in our example, we would have 251 rows and then 34 columns, right? We would have 20 MFCC, 12 chroma, and then two more columns for the embeddings. And for the embeddings, each of the time frame, each of the frame, uh, the embeddings represented in each of the frame are the same because they're just repeated 251 times. Okay, so then uh, we have the, uh, we pass it through the Kong1D layer and uh, we have 32 filters, which is why the output dimension is 251 by 32. And then we pass it to a max pooling 1D layer, which um, has a size of two, so essentially cuts this in half. And then we we'll pass it through another 1D conv layer, which has uh, um, 64 filters. So our output is 125 by 64. And then we we'll pass it through another max pooling, which uh, outputs is uh, 62 by 64, right? And then we we'll pass it through a flattening layer, which um, it, it basically just squashes this 2D representation of 62 by 64 to a 1D representation of uh, 300, uh, around 3,900 uh, features. And then we pass it through a fully connected dense layer with the output, uh, output uh, units of one, around 1,000. So essentially 
this is reducing the number of features, right? So in our dense layer, um, we reduce the number of features from around 4,000 to only 1,000. And then we pass this through a dropout layer where we, uh, the dropout layer is essentially randomly turning off um, some number of the neurons in the neural network to help prevent overfitting. And um, after that, we pass it through a dense layer, which um, uh, our output for the dense layer is three because we have uh, three species for to classify. Okay. And now I'm going to go over the details of the model uh, implementation. So I'm going to go to the uh, Google Colab notebook. So the, this notebook is the same notebook that I've been using for the fee for neural network. The only thing I changed is um, instead of extracting, uh, loading the features that's average pooled, I'm loading the audio features that's not average pooled. And um, same stuff that I've, we've done before, we shuffle the data and um, then we um, need to create a sample weights based on the um, quality rating. So here I'm saying if the quality rating is bigger than 3.0, again, remember the quality rating is on a scale of zero to five with the 0.5 increments. So if the sample rating is bigger than 3.0, so basically if the sample rating is 3.5, 4.0, 4.5, and five, then I'm going to give the training sample a sample weight of 0.4 versus, um, Otherwise, we'll give the training weight sample weight of point, uh, point, did I say point 0.4 earlier? It should be point 0.6. So again, let me reiterate. Um, if the training sample ha has good quality rating, then I'm going to give it point 0.6 um, sample weights uh, versus if the uh, audio sample has poor quality rating, then I'm going to give it point 0.4 sample weights. And what this effectively does is if the um, audio has better quality, the uh, model is going to give it more weight uh, when um, it does the back propagation so that um, um, you know the the models with the with the better quality is uh, uh, essentially being uh, treated as more important when 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 we uh, train the models. Okay, so now I'm going to go over the one DCNN model function. and uh, similarly, as before we have the build model function, where um, we pass through, pass the audio features as parameters. But here we also pass in a continent feature as another parameter. And I will go over this very soon on why this needs to be passed in separately versus previously, we just uh, basically concatenated uh, the audio features and continent features to be the training features uh, and passing the concatenated feature uh, directly into the build model function. But here we need to pass them, pass them in separately. And then we're also passing the learning rate. So the first thing I do is I clear the back sessions. And uh, so I first set the input layer, which is going to take in the audio features. This should be familiar. So um, our input shape is gonna be 251 by, for example, 20, if we only pass in the 20 MFCCs, and that's gonna create our audio features. And then I need to set the continent features input layer. So I pass in the continents and the continent has shape of one because um, each sample only has one continent. And then I do the string lookup and then I pass it through the embedding layer. And um, the embedding layer is a little bit hard to understand, but uh, essentially we need to specify the input dimension and the output dimension. And the input dimension here is, uh, this number is actually six. Basically how it's calculated is um, we have the number of unique continent features, which I already put here are, um, five, so we have five unique continents, Africa, Americas, Asia, Europe, and unknown. And then we need to plus one for an out, uh, out of dictionary uh, word. So and if the model sees a word that's not any of these five, it's going to um, learn embedding on that and pass it, um, it you know, as an out, out of dictionary word. Uh, it's not strictly necessary in our case to have this out of dictionary word because uh, we know that we only have five words, but um, it's just good practice just in case the models, just in case our data contains a word that the that's not any of these five. And then um, our output dimension is two. Again, this just means that for each of the word, we have um, you know, a, like two different embedding representations for the same word. Okay, so our this creates our location embedding. And then I just create a custom function to be passed to the Lambda layer so that I can tile the location 
to the same shape as the audio features. So what this is doing is basically um, this step right here where uh, we have the embedding of shape one, two, and then we're gonna tile it along the time axis, basically repeating it 251 times, okay? Once we have the um, location embedding and the, um, what's it called? The audio features of the same shape, we can concatenate them. So when we concatenate them, again, we'll, we have the uh, embeddings of shape 251 by two and the audio features of shape 251 by 32. And when we concatenate them, we end up with a shape of 251 by 34. And we can view this as um, a table where we have 251 rows and 34 columns. So the first, for example, the first 20 columns would be MFCC and then the next 12 would be chroma and the next two would be the embeddings for the continents, okay? And once we have all the features ready, we can pass it through the first Conv1D layer. And again, we have 32 filters and our kernel size is five. So when the kernel size is five, that means our filter size is five. So in our example here, we have um, the yellow filter. This would be a filter size of three because we're looking at three rows at a time versus filter size five would be, we essentially look at five rows at a time. And notice here that we don't need to specify, um, you know, how many columns because this is a conv 1D um, and it's basically um, looking at all the columns, right? So our we only need to specify the number of rows, which is five. And then the strides is one. And uh, again, strides one just means uh, move one step at a time. And uh, we use activation function of ReLU and we also use an L2 regularization um, at uh, 0 0.002 strength. So what this does is it basically also helps with the uh, prevent overfitting. Okay, and then we pass this through a max pooling layer where our pool size is two, basically cuts the number of features uh, that's coming out of the count one d layer in half. And then we pass it through another count one d layer with a very similar um, shape as the first conv 1D layer, except now we have 64 filters versus 32. And then uh, we'll pass it through another uh, max pooling layer before we get, um, before that feature gets passed into the dense layer uh, or the fully connected layer to get to uh, basically reduce the number of features to 1000. And then we do the dropout at 50% dropout rate. And then we pass it through the dense layer the final output dense layer where um, it basically classifies our um, audio feature to either um, one of the three species. And we can build a model um, where we call the Keras model and then we can pass in the inputs. And remember here for the inputs, we need to pass in the location and the audio features, right? Because we have, we have two inputs, the location and the audio features. And for the outputs, we just have the uh, output layer and then um, here, I'm also going to print out the model summary when I call this function, and then we can compile the model. And to compile the model, we're using the Atom optimizer, and we're using the sparse categorical cross entropy for loss, and then we have uh, accuracy as our metrics. And again, for our weighted metrics, again, the weighted metrics is, uh, is based on the, uh, the quality rating, where if the quality rating is good, we give it more weight versus when the quality rating is bad, we give it less weight. And the weighted metrics is the accuracy. OK, and then uh, the visualization function is very similar to what we've seen before. The only difference is I also pass in the best epoch as one of the parameters. This will become apparent uh, in a minute, where um, basically I use a callback function to or a callback technique to uh, call the uh, model back to its best weights. Um, so that I need to pass in the best epoch as one of the parameters so that I only need to visualize the um, learning progression up until the best epoch. And okay, so now we're ready to build the model. So we first uh, build the, um, create the audio features and then we create the, uh, also the validation, the train and the validation. Okay, so to uh, create the callback, so, so this is where I created the callback where um, basically I'm using an early stop technique and I'm telling the model, okay, starting from epoch 20, look at the validation weighted accuracy. And if the weighted uh, validation weighted accuracy doesn't improve um, for 10 epochs, then stop training and give me back the best weights that the model has seen so far. 
Okay, so uh, this is why we need to specify the best epoch when we do the visualization so that uh, um, we can just visualize the learning progression up into the best epoch. Okay, so now we're ready to build a model and we're passing the audio feature and the continents and the learning rate as parameters to build the model. And uh, what we call the build model function is going to um, basically print out the summary here. And the summary is just a written out version of the architecture that we went over already. We have the continent, string lookup, embedding, again, embedding has shape one, two, and then what we'll tell the embeddings along the time axis to get the shape to 50, one, two. And then we also have the audio features, and then we concatenate the tiled embedding with the audio features to get our actual input up to 5134. And then we pass it through the conf and conf1d and the max pooling layers and the fully connected layer and the dropout layer before we get the final classification. And our total trainable parameter is around 4 million. As you can see here, all of the parameters are trainable. I'm not going to go over the number of parameters here. You can go over them at uh, your own time. And then we will call the model.fit. Basically, when we call the model.fit, we need to pass in the continent and the audio features again, because our model um, takes in two inputs. One is in location and the other one is the uh, audio features. Okay, so I pass in the continents, which is the location and the audio features um, as the um, audio features input. And how the model knows uh, which one is, is, is which input is by this uh, dictionary name. So the continents is because my input layer is called continents. And then the other one, audio features, is because my input layer for the audio features is called audio features. So uh, yeah, this name is quite important. Otherwise, the model wouldn't know which one's which. Okay, so I pass in the continents and the audio features, and then I uh, pass in the labels and the sample weights. Again, the sample weights is uh, based on the uh, audio recording quality. And then I say train for 100 epoch, but uh, most of the time, it doesn't really train for 100 epochs since we have the callback technique specified here. And then we have the validation data and our batch size 32 and then callback technique and then verbose is one so that we can look at the training progression. And um, we can recall the best epoch using this. Basically, I'm saying, okay, what is the, the highest validation weighted accuracy among all the um, histories? And I'll print out the best epoch and then we can visualize. So let's just stare at the training progression uh, um, verbose output here. Uh, and we can see, you know, even from the first epoch, our weighted accuracy validation accuracy is already 58%. And we can see that throughout each epoch, the weighted validation accuracy continues to increase, which is a very good sign, which means the model is continued to learn. Um, there is a bit of, you know, you can see sometimes it drops a little bit and then it comes back up. So this is kind of expected. Um, it means that the model is still struggling a little bit, but I'm not overly worried about it since overall we can see that the model is continue to learn and improve. And we can take a look at the uh, progression visualization here. Um, so the model reached its best epoch at epoch 13. Remember, even though we specify, hey, chain until epoch 100, um, it stopped at epoch 38 because of the callback technique. And then we, um, uh, the callback is uh, going to call back the best weight when the best weight was reached at the uh, epoch 13. Okay, so uh, this learning curve doesn't look that great. Um, you know, you can see there is a big dip um, at around epoch 4 and epoch 11. Um, but uh, it's uh, also not too bad. You know, you can see that the loss continue to decrease and the accuracy continue to increase, uh, and it's uh, starting to plateau a bit. Um, so that means the model is 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 capturing the features and actually, um, um, you know, generalizing to the validation data uh, reasonably well. Uh, you know, I would really want this to be a bit flatter, but uh, I'm not overly bothered by it. And it's uh, notable to mention that uh, this is not really an apple to apple comparison to the uh, learning progression uh, visualization for all the previous models because all the previous models we have trained until 100 epoch, but here um, we only show the learning progression until the best epoch. So this is kind of a zoomed in view uh, compared to uh, the previous uh, visualization. 
And after that, we can also look at the um, classification report and the confusion matrix. So I'm going to actually go over the model results on the website here. And we can see that MFCC plus RMS plus spectral centroid plus continents had the best performance where we had the validation accuracy of 91% where uh, with the training accuracy of 97%. And this is actually already like so much better than what we've had, you know, in any of the previous models. And in our fee forward neural network, we had validation accuracy of 75 and training accuracy of 84. And even with our um, other previous models, I believe the best performance one was uh, support vector machine, where we got the validation accuracy of 74% with training accuracy of 92. And um, you can see that for support vector machine, this is severely overfitted, right? We have almost a 20% gap between the training accuracy and validation accuracy versus in the 1D, um, CNN model, our gap is reduced to only 6%. It's still a little bit overfitted, but um, it's not really that terrible uh, considering what uh, we have done. And uh, again, the model it hasn't been hyper-tuned. It's just, um, I just chose the filter size and, and the number of embedding output dimension arbitrarily. And I'm sure this can um, perform even better if uh, we experimented it uh, even more. And um, yeah, so the 91% validation accuracy is the best so far. And um, it's actually a pretty good result considering, um, you know, generally I think uh, the audio, like the bird call is uh, um, difficult to classify, but um, um, again, remember we only have three species. So it's definitely not the state of the art here, but uh, let's take a look at the, uh, you know, learning progression here. We can see that the uh, loss continue to decrease and the accuracy continue to increase. There's still a bit of zigzag, but again, I'm not overly worried about it. And um, um, yeah, so so the the progression uh, visualization uh, is actually pretty good for what I was expecting. And then we look at the confusion matrix. Um, I'm not going to go over the details of a uh, you know, how to interpret the confusion matrix. I think I went over this in one of the earlier videos, but just staring at the confusion matrix for a minute, we can see that actually our model is doing decently well with uh, all the three species. And we can also uh, confirm this with the classification report where we can see our, for example, F1 score for the three species are decently balanced. Uh, consent is a little bit lower with a little bit lower precision, but um, overall the um, F1 score is uh, for the three species are generally around the same ballpark. Okay, so I also ran uh, some other models where I didn't use continents. So I omitted continents in as one of the features and um, it's uh, including continents definitely improved the um, model performance. So, um, and I mean, I think it would make sense because um, you know knowing that where the bird is can be um, pretty helpful to uh, help identify which bird is making the call. Okay, so the next thing I will do is I'm going to perform hyperparameter tuning to find the best performing uh, hyperparameter. And to do that, I will be using um, Hyperpot, but um, yeah, I've never actually used it before. So I think it will be interesting and um, I will show that in the next video. Thank you for listening and uh, I hope I'll see you again soon.